from a certain perspective, Brooks Falls and Brooks River is a cornucopia of plenty. It is perhaps the very first place within Katmai National Park where salmon are av available to bears. After a long winter of hibernation and a spring season with little nutritious food, bears feast on salmon to regain their fat reserves. However, access to Brooks Falls and its <clears throat> salmon isn't guaranteed. Productive fishing spots are limited and a bear's hunger isn't easily satisfied. Combine that with the tail end of the bear's mating season, which is happening right now, in which mating opportunities are very limited and the setting is ripe for competition and conflict. Through their system of dominance and their hierarchy, bears survive in a world of limited resources. Hi everyone, this is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. Joining me today is park ranger Naomi Boak at Katmai National Park. Naomi, great to see you and it looks like you have a beautiful day to be outside talking about bears. It is a perfect day here. Um, we couldn't have asked for anything better. I'm on the lower river and um, I hope we see a bear go by at some point. Yeah, hopefully we'll be lucky enough for that. And especially if there's two bears interacting with one another because hierarchy and dominance is the topic of today's live chat. And it's an important one given the time of year at Brooks River and the needs of the bears who gather there. First, we'll discuss dominance and the hierarchy as it relates to bears. Then we'll talk about the characteristics of dominant bears and where certain <laughs> groups of bears sit in the hierarchy. We also have clips from the bear camps that highlight how bears establish and maintain dominance. Finally, we'll try to answer a few of your questions as well. So if you're watching right now, uh, you can drop your questions in the chat uh, throughout our program today, and we'll try to answer um, many of those during the broadcast and especially at the very end of the broadcast. And the first really big surge of salmon pushed up to Brooks Falls overnight. So today is a day when probably all of the bears who are at Brooks River are well fed. Uh, but Naomi, the jostling and the communication and the interactions between bears, they've been ongoing for weeks. We've had bears at the river for quite a while already this summer, and all of those things have a profound implications on their survival. So uh, let's begin our discussion today uh, by talking about dominance in the context of bears. Yeah, well, um, dominance is having um, influence and power over someone, something, some other bear. And um, it's really important um, because these bears are sharing a very rich resource and bears don't usually share. And um, so um, dominance is not about showing off. It's not about being, I'm proud, I'm the biggest, I'm the best. It's really about survival and about thriving and access to these resources. Um, if a bear is dominant, it means it has access to prime fishing spots like 747 here in the jacuzzi um, and making sure he has that access. Um, it also means protection from injury. Um, they, they don't want to be injured. It, for sows, it means protecting the cubs. If they're dominant enough, they can um, they can not only protect their cubs, but they can fish and eat. So all this is really important for the, the bear's season. Um, uh, dominant bears here, um, they sort of have to show and prove their dominance. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a male bear. Females can be dominant, dominant too. But it's a combination of size and attitude. And why we think of boars mostly as the most dominant bears is obviously they're a lot bigger than the sows, but sows have a lot of tood, so um, we need to watch for that. And it takes um, tenacity, especially at the beginning of the season. It takes a lot of work, and, you know, is it worth it? Um, um, I think it is because the bears have um, greater greater access to what they need, which is um, the, the best fishing spots and also to mates. And being dominant means success, but a bear doesn't have to be dominant to be successful. And I think of 151, who for many years as a younger, smaller bear would fish very successfully in the riffles. 
where he didn't have to compete with the big boys. And he would get really fat. And by the time he got really fat, he, he was confident enough to go and fish on the lip and not worry so much about the big boys. So success can be in lots of different places, but dominance helps bears sort things out. Um, and, you know, it's a great season to be watching this because this really usually happens um, early in the season, but um, things can change. And I think this is a season of change, Mike. Um, what characteristics define rank in a hierarchy? just dominance what defines it yeah for bears there's a few things that you can look for and they sort themselves into a hierarchy that's that's fairly regular based on a few things maybe the most important thing is is size so in the bear world size matters body size specifically bears use their body size to intimidate other bears uh, so on average, the larger the bear, the more dominant it's going to be. And when you're watching bears at Brooks River, you're looking at some of the largest brown bears in the world. Females, uh, brown bears are usually, you know, they might weigh like one half to two thirds as much as a, as a, a fully grown adult male. Uh, but the average body size for an adult male in Katmai in midsummer, so coming up right around, you know, the beginning of August or so, the average size is seven to 900 pounds. And the biggest adult males at Brooks Falls weigh more than a thousand pounds already. So you're looking at real giants walking across the landscape. And if you're a big adult male, then you almost are always viewed as more dominant by smaller bears. And while the benefits of large body size is utilized most obviously by large adults, even uh, young independent bears use size to their advantage to challenge and displace smaller bears when the circumstances uh, are, are right for that. Size isn't the only factor influencing dominance in bears though. Disposition plays a huge role. And the most dominant bears are not only big, they're also assertive and they're willing to challenge other bears. 856, who we'll talk about more in the broadcast, he's a great example of this. Not only is he a very large bear, he's also extremely confident and assertive. Assertiveness isn't limited to, to really big guys like 856. We see it among bears of many different ages and sizes. 128 Grazer, a mature adult female, showcases this. We'll talk about her in detail a little bit later on as well. Uh, this position, you know, really appears um, uh, important for bears, uh, you know, throughout the, the hierarchy and especially so in the mini hierarchy that establishes amongst cubs of the same litter, especially when cubs are hungry and mother's milk might be in short supply. And then maybe finally, the final characteristic uh, that you can look for in animals that are particularly dominant is uh, fighting skills. Uh, when necessary, they will fight. Bears avoid fights. We'll talk about how they do that and how they can sort out their differences without fighting. But every once in a while, they will fight when they can't resolve, resolve uh, disputes through body size and, and posture. So being big, being assertive, that brings advantages for bears. Since fully grown adult males are the largest bears on average, they have a distinct advantage and typically attain the highest position in the hierarchy. But these characteristics, like body size and behavior, influence the position of all bears in the hierarchy. And Naomi, when, when bears experience extra motivation, like a mother bear will, then we'll see them showcase how maternal instincts affect their position in the hierarchy. Yeah, I mean, sows with cubs can be very dominant and really be high up in the hierarchy. Um, I think of 854 Divot as an example. I mean, we don't think of her as such a dominant bear when she's without cubs, but when she has cubs, she will not take guff from any bear. I mean, I've seen her shoe off um, the most dominant bears, 747, 856. She, she really protects those cubs and, and the big bears don't mess with her. They know she's a dominant bear. And um, I mean, when we classically think of a really fierce dominant bear with cubs, we think of 128 Grazer. This is a bear with a lot of attitude. She, when she has cubs, you just don't mess with her. She has fought the biggest bears on the river. She will, you know, shoe off 856 and 747. I mean, uh, there is a, a picture of 
of her attacking 856, he's twice her size, maybe, you know, three times her size. But she's fearless and when she has cubs. And, you know, what's interesting also about females um, and their dominance is that when we see bears um, displaying dominance, um, positioning themselves in the hierarchy, you'll see bears um, like the top bears, like 856 and 747. They'll see a bear they think is a threat and they'll, you know, they'll go over to that bear. And they'll, they'll try to show, I'm the top dog. You better back off. This is establishing who I am for the season. But I, with females, um, it seems with or without cubs, it's more a situational thing. They're not going out of their way to show another bear, hey, I'm tough. It's when they're defending a fishing hole when they're defending a cub. I mean, Grazer, when she's in the riffles, is just as powerful and dominant as, as she is when she's on the lip of the falls. But we're talking about Grazer with cubs. And um, this year, Mike, Grazer is a single female. Um, will she be as dominant? What do you think? What about single females? How, how dominant are they? Where do they fit in the hierarchy? Well, with Grazer, I think her reputation precedes her. We have some great clips of that to talk about, I think, a, a little bit later on. But it can be confusing in the middle of the hierarchy because, you you know, typically, again, big males at the top, um, uh, especially defensive mother bears, you know, kind of below them. And then after that, it's often, often a large jumble of bears. Sometimes fully mature adult males are in there, but most often it's uh, composed of single adult females, some younger adult males. In their rank and kind of where they sit in the hierarchy and who they who they yield to, who they're dominant over, is highly dependent on their individual behaviors and tolerances for one another. Uh, so Naomi just talked about a five four divot, a one two eight grazer, and both of those bears provide examples of adult females who can rank somewhat high in the hierarchy, depending uh, on the cohort of bears that they're near and whether they're caring for cubs. And we often get that question about is there a hierarchy among female bears and there certainly is but it's uh like Naomi said too it's like it's not usually as intense or displayed as obviously as it is among adult males so, so in general adult female bears at brooks river they display greater tolerance towards each other uh and cubs compared to uh, adult males uh, yesterday for example grazer showed an extraordinary tolerance for nine ten in her cubs we were trying to steal a fish and scavenge from here. And this is a clip of that. So watch the lip of the falls. In this clip, Grazer just caught a fish, 9, 10, and her cubs were flanking her, basically, trying to take this fish away. Uh, and had you asked me a hypothetical question, laying out that scenario before last evening, if you would have said, what would Grazer do if cubs from another litter tried to scavenge fish from her? I would have said those cubs are risking a lot for a little bit of fish. <laughs> And Grazer in that situation isn't at a disadvantage here because she's trying to protect her catch. So she can't really fully sort of defend um, her position and her catch without dropping the fish, giving the other bears what they want. But even so, she maintains a calmness and a tolerance that is unusual for her and many bears in general in that situation. So while a bear like Grazer remains basically kind of near the top of the hierarchy among single female bears, she clearly makes choices about who she confronts who she displaces, and why she does so. And the lip of the falls overall is Mike, perhaps the best place to watch these interactions. And Mike, I think that she also has a, a history of being uh, tolerant uh, with uh, sows with cubs. Um, I mean, she allowed 806 and her cub on there with her. And um, I think it shows the power of um, a, a cubs that that gives a sow some some sway in in the hierarchy so that grazer is like okay it's sow with cubs maybe i'm not i'm not gonna be my usual self i don't know just an observation yeah you know i don't i think there's definitely some truth to that because we do see female bears sometimes showing you know a greater amount of tolerance for uh for our other bear families not always but we can witness that on the cams and you know another example of that i think happened maybe late late last night 
um, you know, around midnight Alaska time. There was 402. She was on the lip. She caught a fish. And then maybe it was like 806's cub or something walked over uh, to try to get fish from 402. It's not her mom. Uh, and 402 was like, uh, yeah, you can you can be right at my face. I mean, it, it would never happen, you know, I think with with um, with other bears who maybe haven't experienced motherhood uh, before. So, yeah, I think that is definitely something to watch for. And one of the things that makes watching bears um, so, so fascinating. Uh, so in this, like this middle ground of the bear hierarchy, sometimes sorting out who outranks who can be difficult. And there's no rule that says one bear has to be higher than the other in the hierarchy. They can kind of be of equal rank and tolerate one another if, if they so choose. Uh, but positions in the hierarchy among bears are frequently depend on subtleties of body size and disposition and the bear's mood and the personal experience with that other bear. Uh, so Naomi, I, I think that remains true among uh, bears also who tip, typically occupy the lowest tier in the bear hierarchy. And those are the bears we call the sub adults. Yeah, the sub adults, those teenagers of the bear world, um, they, they know pretty much that they are at the bottom of the hierarchy and they are really mindful of of the the adult bears will move away very quickly um and it's tough because they're they're growing up as well as out so they have a lot of eating to do but it's tougher for them they have to give way to um to other bears now sometimes they'll try what we call stealing now stealing is not a bad thing in the bear world it's let's not you know chastise bears for stealing um and and the, i think there is a bit of a hierarchy among um some adults i mean if you think about 503 when he was a sub adult he sort of was master of the sub adult universe and some of the other sub adults deferred to him he sometimes fed them well, see, there's a sub-adult experiencing uh, life as a young bear. Just so, um, so 503 is an example of where size does matter in that sort of junior world. And another one that's interesting to me is 164, who is now a young adult. But as a sub-adult, he found his place, a unique place, under the falls, right next to the jacuzzi, which is the prime fishing spot and um he's been allowed to stay there so i mean it's an it's another um testament to a bear's ingenuity um so um you know it's the it's a tough life for sub adults but they you know and they also have to run away from mom i mean uh poor 335 was chased off by her mother, Holly. Holly is not tolerant of her cubs. They're out of the house, they're gone. No coming back and sleeping in the basement. They are out. And here you see her chasing 335. So not only do they have to worry about other bears and find a place to fish, but if they run into mom, it's not, not a happy thing. Um, so, there, there are certain behaviors among these bears, Mike, um, that we look for when we're judging, um, judging dominance and hierarchy. And I think it's, it's, it's fun and important to go over them, especially this season, because I, um, I think things are fluid this season for a number of reasons. And um, hierarchy is going to be a really important story to watch throughout the season. Absolutely. And bears are individualistic and the relationships between individual bears is fluid no matter where a bear stands in the higher hierarchy so we'd like to walk through a few clips and highlights from the cams from the season that illustrate how bears communicate uh, with each other and also establish uh, dominance and in these clips i want um you know if you're watching at home to pay attention to the body posture of the bears how do they position one another uh, when they're in close quarters or how do they approach one another so pay attention to that pay attention to their head and ear positions as well because that can tell a lot about the bear's motivations uh, listen for vocalizations uh, in in these videos as well if bears happen to make them and then also we'll discuss uh, how you can determine a quote-unquote winner 
in these encounters because sometimes it's not as obvious as uh, you might think. And the first clip that we have is an example of a dominant bear catching a subordinate bear by surprise. And as we start this clip, you'll see 151 Walker here on the bank and he's quickly surprised by 856. 856 is the one who forced him into the water. 856 pushes Walker back. And this I think was seen on July 1, a time when many bears are getting reacquainted with each other. Uh, Naomi Walker is submissive in this encounter, even as he works to defend himself sort of towards the end of this clip. So other than 856 forcing Walker to yield space, in what other ways is 856 perhaps communicating uh, his confidence in this situation? Well, his, his head is down and he's pushing him back. Um, and, and walk, I mean, it's interesting because Walker has been trying to work his way up the hierarchy. Um, so, so, oops, don't lose my headset. Um, so, you know, he's, um, he's trying to hold his own, but he just can't with 856. 856, I mean, it looks like to me, you know, there's some jaw action, so maybe he's jaw popping at him. And this was certainly an example of a dominant bear engaging with another bear simply to establish and reaffirm dominance. 856 didn't want that spot on the bank. Yeah, so this wasn't over a fishing spot, wasn't over a, a mating opportunity, no females in the vicinity. It was simply to say, I'm the boss here, and I want you to remember that the next time we are next to one another. And the, the next clip that we'll see there are definitely some similarities. Um, and this clip is from a play-by-play -play that Ranger Felicia and I hosted in early July. Again, you'll see 856 con confront a rival bear. So let's listen to what we had to say in the moment. And then afterward, um, I'll give Naomi a chance to provide her thoughts on what she saw in this interaction. I can't see if there's another bear coming, but it does Seems seem like- like they noticed. Yeah, 747 is scenting another bear downstream. This is one of those instances where you're like, I wish I could ask him. Um, and, hey, are you, uh, you know, are you noticing? What are you, what are you sensing right now? Oh, and he is, yeah, 856 oh. is coming right now. All right. So we're one, we've, I've been looking to see how these two bears interact right now. 856, again, very dominant, 747, very dominant. Beginning of last summer, 856 was more dominant. The end of last summer, 747 was more dominant. All right, here he comes. Yeah, 856 right now, look at him. Ears forward, directed stare, direct approach to 747. 747 already moved out of his fishing spot to face 856. 747 sort of sitting, yeah. in a, and that's kind of often in a more um, subordinate pose, but yeah. 856 is this child. Ears pointed yeah. up, 747's head is pointed down. Okay. Oh. So a bite threat from 856, 747 sort of trying to defend himself in that situation. Now 747 I think has the bulk, but 856 I think is taller. Um, and 856 is a, is a good fighter. You know, when bears fight with 856, they tend not to try again. Licking his lips a lot, that's something that 856 does. Now 856 turning and walking away, which basically indicates that he uh, is the quote unquote winner of that interaction. It's, um, unless it's over like a, a singular resource, like a fishing spot or a mating opportunity, it's gonna be the, the bear that wins these dominant interactions that walks away okay. from those encounters. Uh, so. 856-747, and if you're keeping score at home, you're wondering who's more dominant between these two bears, I think we have our answer. That was pretty clear to me that 856 is more dominant. Mm -hmm. So to me, that, yeah, to me, that was a clear-cut example of 856 challenging another bear, the other bear not uh, calling 856's bluff, if it was a bluff, and it probably wasn't with him. Uh, so A56 was able to take that fishing spot, and we haven't seen 747 mount the challenge uh, against A56 since since then. 
Um, so what did what did you see in that clip? Anything different? No, I mean it was you know it's again interesting. He's coming from you know way downstream and forcefully saying I am going to not only displace that bear him who I am right. I mean it's it's of dominance and a displacement and also interesting that 747 didn't challenge him anymore and so my, i always wonder in my head um i mean i i always think that bears don't really want to fight because it means potential injury um and clearly i mean as big and dominant a bear as 747 is um if he had really thought he could challenge Eight five six, he would have, and not have been a pretty fight. But eight five six was just able to stroll in there and say, "I'm king," and uh, you better understand that. And I've seen very similar encounters between those two this year, which is very different. I mean, this is going to be a really interesting year among among those bears. And those bears have been doing this and posturing like that and competing like that. Just those two encountering one another again and again and again for almost their whole entire lives. Uh, we've certainly seen it, uh, I think, come to come to a head in since 2011. And basically every year they've been competing for sort of like the top rung of the hierarchy at uh, Brooks Falls. And last year, seven, at the end of last year, 747 was clearly more dominant. So it's a switch this year, A56 kind of back at the upper echelon, which uh, I didn't expect, to be honest with you, because 856, is, he's not a young guy. I mean, he's in his uh, early, his early 20s uh, or right around 20 years old. So yeah, he's um, he's living a, living at the top still, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and we have another- I uh, mean, and, clip, and it's, uh, I, I was just gonna say again. about 856. Oh, no, and think how long he's been at the top. I mean, 11 years, maybe more than that. That's a long yeah, time to defend that there, spot. Right? Yeah, well, yeah, a couple of hiccups, but still. And we have another clip of 856 confronting 747 near Brooks Falls, Naomi. Um, and I, you provided this one for us. So what's 856's motivation yeah. in this one? This was just to show him, just to show 747 who he was. I mean, 747 wasn't in a fishing spot. He wasn't uh, trying to challenge him. It was... 856 just coming down to say, hey guy, you know who's the top top bear this year? Not you. And and it's clear, I mean, he 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 uh, chastises 747 and he walks away, cowboy walking. And it was interesting because after this and after 856 left, um, 747 did cowboy walk away um uh but not in pursuit of 856 another forceful display of dominance and and another um kind of display of dominance that we don't see among females and when uh, a bear turns again just to kind of clarify and and walks away from his opponent that basically says to the other bear, I don't consider you a threat at all. I'm exposing myself to attack, and what are you gonna do about it? It's like, oh, just try me, just try me. It's almost like they're saying that. So again, unless a bear wants a fishing spot or a singular food resource or like a mating opportunity, it's the winner who walks away from those encounters. Um, so again, watch for that when you're seeing bears and you can't quite figure out what they're jostling over. Sometimes it's just a bear trying to remind and affirm his dominance over um, another bear. And most disputes between bears are settled in this manner, but not all of them. Occasionally two bears can, can't sort out their differences through posturing, which leads to situation, situations like we'll see in our next clip between uh, number 32, who's nicknamed Chunk, and 747. Naomi, this clip is short, but um, who initiated this encounter? <coughs> Um, it was um, 747 initiated it. Um, he, you know, he feels that Walker, uh, I mean, sorry, that Chunk is a threat, right? So he, he wanted to show him I'm more dominant, but Chunk stood up for himself. And you can see that, 
you know, he forced 747 back. This is not an easy display of dominance for this bear. And I, I think, uh, I think he lost. I think 747 lost this one. Yes, I would agree with that for sure. We don't see the whole interaction in this clip and the cams were looking in a different direction or they were, you know, we had a, a glitch in the internet at that time. So we didn't see see it on cam when it happened. So we're lucky enough that a, that a, a park visitor was uh, able to record that and share it with, with Naomi. Uh, but um, 32, he firmly established his dominance over 747 in this clip. And this has led to a tangible benefits for Chunk. Let's take a look at another encounter between Chunk and 747. Chunk's behavior in these clips indicates he no longer perceives 747 to be a serious threat because in these clips, 747 is fishing successfully and, and Chunk is coming right over and taking that fish away. That is not something you would have seen over the last several years because 747 was the more dominant bear. And Naomi, stealing is a behavior filled with risk, but I don't think anyone would have predicted at the beginning of summer that Chunk would be stealing from 747. No, no. I mean, I hadn't seen that clip before, and it's truly amazing. And again, Chunk is, um, he's really in his prime, and he, he has been trying to move up um, in the hierarchy for a few years, but just hasn't been successful and kind of backed off. But um, he obviously um, felt some strength and some advantage after that counter with 747 and he's just not afraid of him anymore. So again, uh, dominance and hierarchy is in play this year. And um, and I also think it's interesting because these guys are gonna have to keep proving their dominance because it's not like in the last few years where it was clearly one bear or another. We've got uh, like 32 chunk moving up. So, um, I don't know, um, another soap opera to watch. Definitely many storylines uh, associated with the big guys up at Brooks Falls. But that, again, we talked about how the hierarchy uh, affects all bears. And we'll get to some of those, um, some of those stories in just a second here. But since we, we've been talking a lot about the big guys, there were a couple of questions that came in uh, about them. Somebody, um, was wondering about, let's see if I can find it here in my list, it is, are, are, oh, here it is, yes. Are, are top male bears usually the ones that also mate more often than others? Well, I mean, if there's a fight um, over a female, um, that male would have an advantage. I mean, this year, we don't, I mean, we see some mating, but we don't see a lot around here. Um, it was interesting early in the season because 747 was the only male we saw courting females. And, um, and I wondered, is that just because the other males have, don't want to compete? Because um, some other males like Chunk had been around and then they left. Um, but, um, you know, being dominant also means you have greater access to females. Yeah, there's, we don't have like the, the genetics evidence for the Brooks River area to say with certainty that a bear like 747 or 856 or Chunk is siring more offspring. I think it's highly likely though. Uh, the, the bear population at Brooks River is, is really dense. So even like a young male probably has the opportunity sometime or another to, to, uh, to mate with a female who's in um, at the peak of her estrus cycle. But when you're really big, you're not only, you know, providing yourself access to uh, fishing spots, but you're also providing yourself access to mating opportunities because you have the, the size uh, to guard your access to females um, because you have to sort of habituate the female to your presence. It's not, not usually like two bears come together and then just ma the magic happens. That does happen occasionally, but most of the time the male has to habituate himself to the female. The female has to get used to um, his presence. So there, there have been studies in other areas of Alaska that have found like the big, really mature males uh, do have more mating opportunities, do sire more offspring. So yeah, I know we had a couple of questions in our queue um, about that. Um, you know, another related question was, are the top male bears usually the ones that also 
um, mate more often. And then, uh, yeah, dude, does a hierarchy come into play for mating? And I certainly think it does. And it may have implications for female bears as well. Female bears might be selecting maybe for more dominant bears or maybe some bears that um, they just favor uh, perhaps more than others based on um, past experience. That really hasn't been teased out very well scientifically, but I, I suspect that females do play uh, or some role in the, the choice in the, in the mating season. Yeah, I mean, I can think of two pretty dominant females who um, who are courted by many, many males during the season, and that's um, 854 Divot um, is one, and um, certainly um, 128 has been, been pursued, but um, with Divot, when she's she's alone, she's really pursued. And 402, I mean, 402 has had eight litters. Um, I mean, if you're a male, I think you want to mate with a with a female that's going to produce all those litters. Yeah. So establishing your dominance in the past, or simply through body size, like in that moment in time, that can have direct benefits for bears. And we have a um, clips that that do highlight that. So speaking of number 128 Grazer, she doesn't have cubs this year, but she's a bear who has a reputation and I think her reputation precedes her. So in these clips, pay attention to the bear who's fishing on the lip on the fall as when Grazer approaches. Um, so this first one will have two bears fishing uh, on the lip of the falls. One just catches a fish and is walking away at the moment so at your uh, upper right. Um, Grazer is approaching in that direction uh, and on the lip itself, I think that's uh, 903, who's believed to be her former, uh, her former cub from her first litter. Notice how Grazer, uh, direct approach, she wants to fish the lip. Um, 903 seems to recognize that and just turns and, and walks away. Um, so notice how Grazer doesn't, she doesn't need to engage with 903. She simply walks in his direction and um, he gets out of, out of the way. She has a reputation. And Grazer's dominance extends to other bears as well, including at least one adult male who does not seem willing to engage with her at all. We've seen it several times this summer. And this clip is from our Falls Low Camps. So you're going to want to watch the Lip of the Falls again because you have 151 Walker fishing on the Lip of the Falls uh, when Grazer <laughs> approaches. Grazer is the bear at um, sort of like center left. So she's going to walk off screen here uh, momentarily and then reappear. So watch Walker's behavior on the lip of the falls because he's fishing. Of course, he's hungry. He wants a, uh, a fish. But when Grazer approaches, he decides, you know what? It's, it's not worth it. I've, I've tangled with her before. Uh, she's beaten me up a few times and I don't want to want that to happen again, even though she does not have any cubs this year. So he just turns and he walks away. He leaves before she even has to decide to confront him. So she moves with a directed approach and gets that fishing spot. And Naomi, we've seen Walker do this more than once when Grazer has approached his fishing spot. We've seen, we both saw it, I think, down on the Ripples a few times. Yeah, no, um, um, a few weeks ago, um, they were both fishing down at the Riffles and um, she pushed him away. I mean, he just looks at her and goes, nah, okay, the spot is yours. Um, and and that's part of what happens with a the hierarchy. They don't have to repeatedly have confrontations all season, um, un unless something changes, um, or um, or maybe the amount of fish change. But he didn't have to, you know, he didn't have to give her a second chance to rough him up. Right. Bears remember each other across days and seasons and years. So they don't need to reestablish the hierarchy every time they come in contact with one another. And Grazer's reputation and toughness as a mother bear appears to carry over this year, even though she's single, she's not defending cubs. Uh, I haven't seen Grazer beat up on Walker this year. So I think Walker simply remembers what she's capable of. It gives Grazer the advantage. And uh, some st statistics that I kept about bear interactions some years ago, I think further support this. Uh, so just a little uh, the side note here in story, I, I kept statistics on bear interactions that I witnessed at Brooks Falls in 2011, looking at my list, 2013 through 2016 and 2018 and 2019, for a total of uh, 436 hours of observations. 
I noted 1,745 interactions during that time, uh, but no bear was involved in more interactions than 856. So again, he's the bear in the foreground here, challenging another bear like he's uh, apt to do. And 856 was involved in 595 of those interactions. So almost a third of my observations from that time. And the amount of interactions uh, could have simply indicated that he was at the falls more than other bears. So to understand how dominance confers advantages to him and other bears, I looked at the type of interactions he was involved in. And 856 was the more dominant bear in nearly every encounter I saw with the exception of two situations when he backed down to a particularly defensive mother defending her cubs. More importantly, 856 often didn't challenge or engage forcefully with other bears. Half of 856's quote unquote winning interactions were what I classified as avoidance interactions. Like we saw in the examples with Grazer just a moment ago, bears simply saw him coming and they got out of the way. So. Again, why would a bear like 856 spend so much time early in the season challenging other bears? In the long run, it paves off in, in energy savings. Once bears learn that 856 is more dominant and willing to assert himself, then the other bears just get out of his way. They don't want to engage. They don't want to, they don't want to pick that fight again because they know it's one that they're not going to win. To get what he wants, most often, um, the only thing 856 has to do is walk in their direction. So in this way, he gets what he wants, uh, such as access to productive fishing spots without having to expend extra energy. One day, Naomi, I mean, we're both looking for it. One day, another bear will finally displace 856, and it could be a violent encounter. I mean, it's amazing that 856, and the reason I say I'm looking for it is because for the last several years, I have expected 856 to finally kind of take uh, you know, a step down in the hierarchy and remain there. And I thought maybe last year was it. I thought maybe 2017 was it, but he's proven to be a, an extremely tough and a, extremely resilient bear. Uh, and until another bear displaces him, he's living at the highest rung of success for uh, for male bears. It's really been amazing to watch. And I, th I think, um, you know, every time you see him as well, you're kind of like, wow, he's an impressive bear. Yeah, and, and he does clear the room. I mean, he he walks in and he and he clears the room, and it just shows, you know, that early season, all those um, displays that we saw with seven four seven and and um, with Walker. I mean, it it's establishing the rest of the season for him. So all he has to do is enter the river, and he can do what he wants, and um, so it. You know, that tenacity pays off and those displays pay off for him. But he's getting older. I don't know. Right. You know, and every year he's facing competition from younger bears. Uh, and it's, it's, again, remarkable that he has remained as dominant as long as he has. Uh, as we near the conclusion of our live chat, Naomi, we want to also discuss tolerance among bears. Their, their hierarchy evolved, so they um, most often can settle disputes without resorting to physical violence. However, bears are not asocial animals. Um, they were frequently described that way in the scientific literature. Uh, and however, especially when we watch them at Brooks Falls, they can display a high level of tolerance and affinity even uh, for each other when the circumstances are right. So what influences the bear's overall tolerance for another bear? Well, I mean, one thing is um, space, right? If there is enough space for the bears to achieve their objectives, um, not feel threatened and feel like they can um, do what they need to do, which is, is fish. Um, and I think, you know, again, the hierarchy helps develop that tolerance. Um, and um, it also helps when females can protect their cubs, right? Um, it develops, um, you know, they can be tolerant once they've established, so, you know, bear like grazer, she's established that she can own the lip when, when, when she's up there. So um, that does. And I think a really big topic of conversation, especially this year about tolerance is availability of food. And um, I know we've been talking about where are the salmon, where are the salmon, and we're finally seeing salmon jump the falls. But availability of food will certainly change 
the the amount of of tolerance that bears have for each other. I mean, this many bears in one small space is is not common. It's it's not unique, but it's it's not common. So there are a lot of things they do um, to um, sort of do you know I call it a dance of tolerance. Um, but in terms of availability of food, Mike, how do you think this year um, that availability of food will affect the tolerance of the bears? Well, I, I hypothesize that bears compete so intensely with each other at times because they must work so hard to get fat for hibernation. So that's kind of like the typical world for them. Their typical experience is that they need to work very hard for limited resources, limited amounts of food. And at Brooks River, the availability of salmon seems to have a direct effect on the tolerance and playfulness expressed by bears. So you can, if you've been watching the cams all summer, you can contrast this year with 2022 and 2020. So during 2020, the salmon run was two and a half times larger than this year. So like the scenes we saw at the falls earlier today, fish were everywhere every day for months. There was no competition for food or fishing spots. Bears were essentially released from food competition, and we saw few aggressive encounters that year. Very different than this, this year. In 2022, the availability of salmon was unusually high in late July and through August. And I think that had a direct influence on the integration of 909 and 910 families last year. 909 and 910, they're sisters from the same litter. During 2022, 909 had a yearling and 910 had a spring cub. In August, they played, traveled, and fished together as a single group. We had never seen anything like it. So had salmon not been abundant at the end of the summer, I, I think it's doubtful those families would have developed such a relationship and a friendship. I don't think it's a stretch to say that they were friendly and friends at that, that point in time. What do you, what do you think, Naomi? No, I think that's true, and I think in years when there have been abundance, we've seen um, family groups on the lower river hanging out together, um, mothers not being as protective of their cubs and letting the cubs play together. Um, it's the stress level is lower for those bears because they're they're getting fed, and. Um, so um, we see it in, in many different ways and not just at the falls. And we're going to get to uh, audience questions here in just a moment with the remainder of our time. Uh, but one question I think that's on the, the minds of a lot of people, and it has to do with the tolerance of bears and the hierarchy and the way that they are aggressive with one another or not, depending on how web fed they are, is again about the salmon run. Is it slower this year? We had a question submitted in advance about this. So Hope was wondering, is the salmon run slower this year? If so, why? Uh, and this year, the salmon have been quite slow to arrive in large numbers in Brooks River. Today really was the first day that we saw salmon leaping the falls um, in, in great numbers. So a greater number, or excuse me, a greater than average number of salmon that would otherwise swim into Brooks River, they could have been captured in the commercial fishery due to mere chance. I mean, that could happen. Like they, they manage the escapement very well to ensure the, the sustainability of the run, but some, the, the nets are just where they are out in the ocean, out in Bristol Bay. So they, you know, there could be mere chance where they happen to catch a few more fish that were otherwise destined for Brooks River. We don't really know for sure. There's a variety of factors. Some of the others could be um, maybe that survival for juvenile salmon in the Brooks River watershed wasn't good three to five years ago, which would have reduced the number of adults returning this year. Maybe so many salmon returned at younger ages because we had really large runs in the past few years that um, there are fewer fish from those populations, those age classes to return this year. Uh, watersheds of large rivers in Bristol Bay are not equally productive either. Uh, there has been some interesting work about isotope studies and they have found that one part of a watershed in Bristol Bay could be going bonkers with fish and support high numbers of juvenile fish um, and spawners, uh, but another part of the same watershed might not be doing as well. So uh, entire landscapes are necessary to sustain salmon runs. So while we hope that the bears we love and we watch on Brooks River each get enough to eat, we must also remember that the whole of Bristol Bay is really kind of greater than the sum of its parts. And we need to continue to protect all of it, um, uh, especially uh, because those years of, of, of plenty will be there and those years of hardship and hunger are gonna be there as well. 
uh, unlike until today, most bears weren't well fed and I'm sure many were hangry. Uh, imagine the desperate hunger that a mother bear must feel when she's nearly exhausted her fat reserves, yes, yet must still produce milk for a first year cub. So in short, the story of salmon, it's one of variability, change, and uncertainty. Their presence has a direct impact on the behavior of the bears, especially the competition they experience regarding the bear hierarchy. So again, we don't really know for sure, Naomi, why um, you know, the salmon were slower to arrive this year, but there could be a variety of factors overall. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or if we just want to jump to um, audience questions because we do have quite a lot of those. Yeah, well, let's, let's answer some questions. All right, sounds good. And thanks to everybody who has submitted questions. Um, you know, I tend to be a little bit long-winded, so we're not gonna have time to answer them all, but we'll do our best to get through <laughs> a bunch of them here. Uh, one of the questions that came in, to, in, in advance was, um, and this is something, Naomi, that we didn't really talk about during the live chat, but it's about families. Uh, and this person was wondering, is there a hierarchy among cubs within a family unit? And among the larger population, is there a female bear hierarchy? So we definitely talked about the female part. We know that um, the female bears have a hierarchy, fits in with all the other bears, just based on size and disposition, um, personal experience, things like that. But what about cubs? Um, do they have a hierarchy oh, within yeah. individual litter? Oh yeah, you can see it. I mean, um, they have, you know, we look at bears as individuals. We're very lucky to be able to have those observations on the Brooks River. And cubs personalities. And I mean, a really good example is, were grazers, two cubs. I mean, one was very so, and the other was really more dominant. I mean, he, he bit his mom in the butt one time or she bit her, her mom in, in the butt. So, um, and I think when you really see it is late in the season when all the bears, even the cubs are in hyperphagia and eating is very competitive because hormonally the bears are made to do nothing but eat. And the bear and those cubs will get very competitive and you can you can see um, which, which cub is more dominant. And, you know, Maybe, Mike, I think I need to turn the camera a little bit. Oh, are we gonna see the bear? Oh, oh bear can you see here. the bear? Below me, are we seeing the bear? I see some sky. <laughs> no, you, I think oh, your camera's no. still pointed in your direction. <laughs> All right, too bad. It's a good view of the sky though, beautiful sunshine there. Sunshine, okay. Really wanted to show you that bear. <laughs> anyway. So now we have a couple Well, next time, we do, we do okay. have a play-by-play -play scheduled for tomorrow, so you can join um, myself and the Rangers for that at 7 o'clock uh, Eastern time tomorrow. Speaking of Grazer's Cubs of the Naomi, another question that was submitted during the live chat today is about <coughs> Grazer's Cubs. Uh, this person was wondering, where do Grazer's Cubs fit into the hierarchy? So Grazer had two-and-a-half-year-olds last year. She separated from them earlier this spring. Uh, so we can maybe talk about how cubs have an advantage in the hierarchy when they're with mom, but what happens after mom separates from them? I think they have to figure things out, right? <clears throat> All of a sudden, they don't have that protection. Now, I suspect that one of Grazer's cubs, the more dominant one, um, will, will um, kind of emulate Grazer. What do you think, Mike? It's possible. I mean, cubs, cubs are like sponges for learning. They watch what their mother does. They pay very close attention to how she behaves, which eats the time of the year that she goes to certain places to find food. So they remember those, those sorts of things. Uh, so when they're with mom and mom happens to be especially dominant like Grazer, hey, then they have advantages that they can't get during their first few years of independence. So those uh, young bears this year wandering around the, on the landscape they, they might push the boundaries from time to time just to test and see how far they can go with other bears, but they're more likely than not to be, um, be brought back down to earth and be like, look, you are not with mom anymore and I'm not gonna take it from you uh, like, I, like I did last year. So I think that's probably their experience um, at, at this, time of the, since this time of the year. And we do uh, know that Grazer um, pushes her cubs off. 
Right. Yeah. So that's maybe their first, sometimes their first experience um, is with mother just saying, you know what, enough is enough. And, um, and it's, it's time for you to leave. Uh, you know, speaking of the hierarchy and the social interactions that we've, we've been talking about, you know, we've been watching camp bears on the bear cams for a number of years since 2012. Uh, so somebody was wondering, now that we've been observing these bears up close for so many years, what new things are we learning? or needing to unlearn about bears, society, families, and clans. And I think, mm -hmm. Naim, I'll give you a chance to think about this for a moment. I really think it's it's one of the things that we should try to unlearn about bears is that they are quote unquote solitary animals. They clearly have social uh, ad adaptations that help them to communicate with one another. And uh, like we see with the hier hierarchy to, um, settle disputes without getting into fights most often we see bears also taking out the comp the companionship of other bears from time especially younger bears so we can see that bears can have friendships as well so it, it, this kind of goes back to what i i mentioned before that i hypothesize that it's really just competition for food that forces bears to live more lonesome lives if they were freed from food competition like they are uh, in captive environments, like in a zoo, then they wouldn't be fighting and competing nearly as much. And zookeepers work really, really hard to make sure that the bears that are in the same enclosure have enough food, they have enough enri enrichment, so they don't fight with one another. So I think like the, uh, the, the so-called solitary nature of bears needs to be reconsidered and, and also considered in the context of how much food those bears have uh, available to them. Yeah, and I also think, um, and we see here at the Brooks River, we see the interactions of bears. I mean, I always say around this time of year, the subadults find each other, right? And they, they move around in gangs and they begin to play and play fight and um, fish together. Um, and that begins a whole social interaction and also think of how they relate to each other and then how that helps them relate to us, right? Um, I mean, I always think of, of bears when they're, they're, you know, they're doing something that might be harmful to humans, it's, it's defensive. Um, they're, they're surprised or they're defending something or um, we're too close or annoying. And those are all social skills that they learn and adapt to with other bears. So I think, you know, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of evidence that they are very social animals. And, um, you know, they start out in litters and they, they play and they play fight and then they become subadults. And I mean, look at Chunk and Backpack. They, they play fought for years. Um, so, yeah, I think you're right. They're not as solitary as they're portrayed. And we only have a couple of minutes left, so maybe just time for one more question. Um, and this one is interesting to consider. Uh, can you name your top five ranked bears in the hierarchy? So uh, for sure, uh, so eight, five, six at the top this year, um, not even mm -hmm. Chunk in 747 will challenge him. So below that, it seems like number 32 is the second ranked bear this year. So we've got 856, right. 32 chunk, 747 is below that. And then it kind of gets a little bit messy. Um, you know, you could maybe think, ah, oh, well, perhaps it's Walker, but he's not really going around challenging other bears as much this year. No. Uh, you know, uh, it could be, you know, Grazer is really high up there. So after the top three, it's really kind of like a mix of bears. And I think it just depends on those in um those rela individual relationships between the different bears beyond kind of like the, the top three bears. And there's also, of course, no rule that there has to be one top bear. You could just have two, two bears at the very top of the hierarchy that just kind of like don't even bother to engage with one another. Um, what do you think, Naomi? Yeah, I, I think um, relationships and circumstance matter, right? So, um, so, that will influence, but I, I don't know. I'm putting Grazer at number three right now. I mean, she's she's pushed other other bears out of there. Um, she's a little older than she was. 
Um, so, um, but uh, I don't know. Maybe things will get uh, get clarified as the season goes on. For sure. And one bear that we haven't mentioned yet because we haven't seen him yet this year is number 503. And he's at an age where yes. we can expect him to balloon. Excellent angler. Probably, it seems like he has the genetics just to go into very large bears. So I've been telling the bear cam audience for years to maybe expect him to one day come back and just start kicking butt around the falls. We haven't seen that happen yet this year. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people are looking forward to seeing uh, 503 and how he interacts with other bears when he comes back. Uh, but Naomi, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. It's always fun to talk uh, about the bear hierarchy, especially with you. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day out there and uh, um, don't, get, don't get sunburned. <laughs> that's that's quite a statement to get my thanks mike so through their system of dominance and hierarchy bears survive in a world of limited resources and we get to witness this on the bear cams right now so tune in pay attention to it it's one of the more fascinating stories to follow every year on the cams i want to thank my co-host park ranger naomi Boak from Katmai national park for joining me and helping out today We'll be back online next week, uh, same bear time, same bear channel for another live chat. And we have a play by play tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern time that you can watch as well. Until we talk again, enjoy the bears. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. And as we like to say at Explore, never stop learning.